Sorbo Show. But you look at that migration, and I'm looking at it, and I'm the first one to bring it up. Three weeks ago, I'm sitting, I'm saying, isn't that a shame? Isn't and then I said to myself, wow, they're all men. There are no men. You look at it. There are so few women, and there are so few children. And not only are they men, they're young men, and they're strong as can be. They're tough-looking cookies. I say, what's going on here? The press plays right into their hands. The press is calling the leader of the pack in Paris a mastermind. So all these kids are sitting home, even in New York and in California and in Massachusetts. Oh, the mastermind. He must. He's not a mastermind. He's a low life. This is just a low life guy. He's a bum. He's a bum. I'll bet he doesn't have a 90 IQ. You take a look at this guy, and they're talking about he's a mastermind. I just told him at the press conference, I said, you got to stop calling these people masterminds. We have a president that doesn't have a clue. We have a president that says ISIS is contained. He's contained. The only thing contained is us. We're contained because we have no leadership. And welcome back to the show. There's Trump uh, speaking right to my heart, I got to say, calling the kid a mastermind in front of all the kids all over the world. And uh, the only people who are contained are the United States. Uh, The fact is Obama will say anything he wants. I pointed this out yesterday. Contained, where's his evidence? on, On what is he making that claim? containment that that they didn't attack paris yet the the containment claim is completely bogus it's just as bogus as the you will save twenty five hundred dollars on your health insurance it cut that he he plucked it out of nothingness and put it down on paper and said that looks good i'll go with that and that's the containment claim. I'm joined now by Andrew Boston, who's a doctor. Uh, he's a professor at the School of Medicine at Brown University, and he's also an author of Jihad, Islamic Holy War, and the Fate of Non-Muslims, The Legacy of Islamic Antisemitism, and several other books. Welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. It's great to talk with you. This is this is serious stuff that uh, uh, that I think uh, Trump has a very has a great way of boiling it down. To just the elements. The only people who are contained are us because we lack leadership. What do you say about that? Oh, I, I think I think you know his 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 populist rhetoric. Uh, sometimes you know you you wonder does he is he really processing things? Um, but but on but on many occasions, I think he does in fact cut to the essence. I I, I also. I also would say, Sam, that he's he's the only one who's forthright enough to to combine two features, and one of which has been glaringly missing from the entire discourse, frankly, going back to 1979, um, which is that, you know, with all our adventures in the Middle East, whether we're supporting pseudo-secular Muslim despots or whether we're supporting overt theocrats and jihadists, as we did, you know, against the Soviet Union, um, there, Trump is the only one who considers that, wait a minute, that we have a homeland, we have a home front, we need, we need to have borders. If jihadism is being fomented in our mosques, and we know that it is, uh, there, there are hard data which suggest that 80% of U.S. mosques, these are good sociological data, uh, by, by, from infiltrators, quite frankly, who found that if you, if you applied a Sharia compliance scale to what was going on in a random sample of 100 mosques, um, that their, their tendency to promote jihad via, via sermons, via materials in the mosque, uh, was directly related to their Sharia compliance. But at any rate, on a, they, Sorry, no, no, 80%. hold on, hold on, hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Explain Sharia compliance. Because I don't, I don't want to gloss over this. I don't want to go too fast. What do you mean by their comp- there's a Sharia compliance scale, and and how does that relate to uh, the rest of that? Sorry. Okay. I, 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 uh, in this particular case, you actually had um, reformed uh, former jihadists that that had secularized, et cetera, had gone through some transformation. And what they did, working with these investigators, is they came up with a scale based on very specific behaviors that took place within the mosque. So, for example, the absence of jewelry, the tightness of the prayer rows, the strict separation of men or women, uh, and other features that, that, that could be identified objectively within these mosques. On that right, measurable. That partic- yes, measurable. That particular scale 
the hypothesis was, Sam, that the more compliant on this scale uh, that individual mosques were, it was a random sample of a population-based random sample of 100 U.S. mosques. The more Sharia compliant the behaviors were in the operation of the mosque, the more likely they would be to foment jihad in some measurable fashion through sermons, uh, through the through the audio and, and vis- video materials, through the books that were available in 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 the mosque, in the mosque bookstores, etc. And, and in was fact, this... they did find they did find that 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 um, the there was a direct correlation between the two, but that overall, eighty one percent, eighty one out of the hundred mosques were were fomenting jihad. These are U.S. mosques. And, and and so when Trump was, was that action of, was it actioned was it an, was did it did it culminate in jihadist action or was it just that if you went into the mosque you would hear the the rhetoric of jihad and then what kind of jihad is it the jihad that that Brennan believes in or is it the jihad that goes and kills people jihad war and in fact jihadic these- war. Yeah, and in fact, some some of these mosques uh, have been hotbeds of of plots. Uh, but 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 the point that Trump made the other day, in a general way, and again in a populist way, was that if we know, for example, the Al Farouk Mosque, which he's familiar with in in Brooklyn, where 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 um, the Blind Chase came from, and 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 other jihadists have come from, um, if we have hard evidence, uh, you know, just just evidence that's incontrovertible that plots are emanating from mosques, that hatred is being preached, that's captured on recordings, etc. These places should be shuttered. That's what Trump is saying. And he's the only person who has, who has the guts to say things like this. Now, you can, you can, people can argue, maybe he's pandering, maybe he doesn't mean it. I don't you know. At this point, he's getting it into the public discourse, whether he actually means it or not, whether he, whether he would actually promote such policies or not. He's putting it in the public discourse, which is a challenge that has never been put out there before. And I think this is very important um, because we, again, we've been through a period now, going back to 1979 where administrations, both Democratic and Republican, have tried every possible way of dealing with the jihadism that that is endemic in in the Middle East and beyond. And we must say, Sam, at this point, you know, whichever policy uh, persons you agree with or disagree with, nothing's working at this point. Nothing is working. Whether, Whether we deploy large forces, nothing's working on a permanent basis. Whether we deploy large forces, whether we ignore things altogether the way Obama is doing, uh, because we are not adequately protecting the homeland, which I think is incontrovertible, we are still vulnerable to these jihadist attacks. And I think, you know, there's a fantastic interview that a real Iraq war hero from 1991, Colonel Doug McGregor, and he's still a colonel because he's too much of an iconoclast. He retired as a colonel. But he won a tank battle for us in Iraq. He turned it around. And, and McGregor is pointing out things like, uh, he says, without the tacit and active support of Turkish President Erdogan and his supporters in Saudi Arabia and Qatar, ISIS could not exist. These are truths, and these are supposed to be our allies, Sam. Something has gone terribly awry. And, uh, you know, there were just a few events that took place uh, very recently, uh, through today, I just learned. So, T- Turkey, there's a, there's a good story, uh, you know, I mean, you can, you can, you can, you can reject a lot of things that come out of the Guardian, but I read this story carefully. Um, but that Turkey has been abetting ISIS by political, economic, um, and even military means, not recently militarily, but as recently as 2014. Um, and, and of course sabotaging the PKK, the Kurds who are actively fighting ISIS. Jordan had a mass rally for a policeman, a jihadist, who killed two Americans. Thousands appeared, called him a martyr, uh, proclaimed death to America. Jordan is not our ally. Um, Sisi, who's well, supposed to be our ally, is prosecuting two young Coptic men who made a video critical of ISIS. Something is not right in the way we're formulating things. Yeah, I mean, you you raised some interesting points uh, and and salient points. I don't know if you can paint with such a broad brush. 
I understand that there are a lot. Look, there are people in the United States who celebrated the Paris attacks, right? We have them here. Uh, so, so you see, you see people, and and in Turkey, just the other day, there was a a soccer match, and they said they were going to have a moment right. of silence, right. and it, and people in the audience booed, but there were other people who were silent. So you know, you you have but, but the different the way, the way factions. The it the, took the it took of, us the, it. Sorry, it took us joining forces with the Soviets to defeat the Nazis. But, but, but of course, there were consequences to that. I mean, the Soviet Union... There are consequences. Up, the, the Soviet Union wound up being a much more dangerous uh, adversary, frankly, than Hitler was, and communizing half, half the world. Uh, you know, so That's, well, there, there are and, and, but I would point out, I would, I would have to point out that we gave up at the end of the war. Uh, uh, Churchill wanted to finish it off. And we didn't have the the chutzpah to to uh, to stick to our to stick to our guns, and and we allowed the Soviet. You know what? I got to take a break. Would you stay with me through the break? Sure, sure, sure. I want to I want to have choice of being governed according to Sharia and the implications of that. So stay tuned. I'll be right back with Andrew Boston after the break. Oh, sure. We cannot allow fear to stop us from having compassion and continuing this humanitarian program. I would like to underscore that the U.S. refugee program is not and has never been a fast-track program. Refugees are not hastily admitted, nor do they show up at our doorsteps. The United States handpicks the refugees who resettle here, and they go through multiple layers of security checks, making them the most thoroughly vetted group of people who come to the United States. All right, welcome back to the show. That is uh, Melanie Cano. She's the executive director of Refugee One. They stand to make a great deal of money bringing more and more people into the United States so they can't be trusted because they have a conflict of interest. And I would just point out that refugees are very patient and so are terrorists. Uh, welcome back to the show. My guest is Andrew Bostom, who has stayed to talk with us a little bit more. Uh, his last book is called the Iran's Final Solution for Israel, The Legacy of Jihad and the Shiite Islamic Jew Hatred in Iran. And I want to talk to you about this study that came out. 51%, they polled, what, 600 uh, Muslims? And 51% yeah, say they would prefer to live under Sharia. Well, Sam, a couple of things. First of all, this is this is not uh, done by a fly-by-night pollster or a polling organization. This is Kellyanne Conway, who's a very respected, savvy pollster. Um, but yes, uh, the specific question uh, was: um, Should Muslims in the U.S. have their own courts or tribunals in America to apply Sharia law, or should they be subject to American laws and courts? So the composite answer was was. 36% said, well, they should be free to choose either. 15% said Sharia courts only. So that's where that figure comes from, the 36 plus the 15. Um, that actually comports with a study uh, that was done a couple of years earlier in 2012. You know, there was a, there was a private polling company, Wenzel Associates, that tried to ascertain uh, who Muslims were going to vote for, were they going to vote for the re-election of President Obama, which they wound up doing overwhelmingly, um, you know, or, or Romney. And in, in that, in that, uh, in that uh, collection of data, they also asked some attitudinal questions. For, first of all, to, to show the validity of the poll, it did predict exactly what happened, which is that Muslims voted overwhelmingly for Obama. But they asked attitudinal questions, including this, the, the, this question of, of, of Sharia versus U.S. law. At that point, uh, it was 32 percent who, who really favored Sharia over, over U.S. law. It's a different sample. It's a different time. Um, but but it's, it's ominous. And 58 percent at that point on the specific question, uh, which, you know, is opposed to our First Amendment, uh, should, should there be, uh, should Americans be allowed to criticize Islam or, or, or Muhammad, 58 percent rejected that idea. So I look at these two surveys about three years apart, and I say, if anything, the, the bad trend has either stabilized or gotten worse. And, and, and I, just, I just wanted to make a quick comment about the, the, the little snippet you played before I uh, came back on about the refugees. Look, sure. the Obama administration has said that, that the Yazidis are, are uh, 
are being genocided against. Right. And 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 that and that and now they won't they won't give the same designation to the Christians, but they admit to quote unquote you know mass massacres. Why aren't those two groups at the top of the list of those that would be allowed to come in? They are absolutely not. There's the, the evidence well, now is incontrovertible about that. That's right. That's right. Uh, and 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 here's where I go off the rails because he's saying, oh, we're we're being inhumane by not wanting to accept the refugees. Where was he two years ago when all the Yazidis were up on the hill and he didn't even want to do a food drop for them or a water drop? Where, where was he two years ago? Shame on him for, bringing up, for, for making us look like we're scared of them when he didn't lift a finger for the Christians who were being persecuted over there. On video, it's, it's, it's an outrage. Uh, Andrew Boston, we've run out of time. Thank you so much for coming on the program. I'll take a quick break. I'll be right back.